Good evening. Thank you for coming to hear about goats. <laughs> um, my name is Andrew Waterhouse. I'm director of the Robert Mondavi Institute. And um, tonight we'll be hearing about a goat barn here at UC Davis. Um, the, the mission of the RMI is to let the public know about some of the wonderful things that are going on here on campus. Usually we do research-related programs, but tonight this is really student and teaching focused. Um, experiential learning is a very important part of being, uh, well, of learning, and I think at UC Davis we do a great job of that. Um, the barns here on campus are one piece of that, um, obviously focused on animal agriculture. Um, I'm from the viticulture department, and we had vineyards and a winery, and we thought we had a lot to take care of. But taking care of live animals is like another world. It's much more complex and uh, perhaps more interesting. <clears throat> so one of the things we're going to be discussing is one of the benefits of having such complicated uh, operations on campus. Um, I can be sure that many schools have abandoned such complex laboratory types of, uh, of efforts. <clears throat> Tonight, uh, for those of you who are in the room here, we also have an online audience. And uh, I'd like to remind the online audience that your questions are welcome. Uh, when we get to the end of the program, we'll ask, we'll, we'll invite your questions and we'll be inviting your online questions as well. So please use in the Zoom, on uh, the bottom of the Zoom menu, there's a Q&A tool for the webinar. So please use that to post your questions and we'll be, we'll be getting to them later. <clears throat> so um, tonight we have um, three speakers here and um, I'm going to just start by um, asking them some questions about how they got involved in, uh, with goats. And I'm gonna start with Christy. So <clears throat> why don't you introduce yourself, but I'm gonna ask you a question. How, how did you end up managing the animal science facilities here at UC Davis? Sure. Um, yes, my name is Christy Portillo, and as mentioned, I'm uh, the facilities coordinator here um, in the animal science department, so I oversee all of the, the animal science barns that we have for teaching, research, and outreach. Um, how did I get into this? I am actually an alum of UC Davis as well, so I ended up coming here over 20 years ago now. Um, as an undergrad in animal science. Um, I actually minored in avian science as well, so quite different from the goat world for sure. Um, but animal science was definitely my track. And initially, I was thinking more about vet school, but hence, here I am today. And um, yeah, that's what brought me this way. So, Ben. Um, <clears throat> What got you interested in goats? All right, I'm Ben Repchus. I'm the facility manager for the goat facility, uh, specifically. And my history with goats dates back to 1995 or so, when I was a little kid. And my mom, she had horses and showed horses. And we had moved to a, a new house, and she was boarding her horses at a, at a boarding facility, but we had space for a quarter horse pony, so we got a quarter horse pony, and then the pony needed a companion, so we ended up getting a goat to keep the <laughs> pony company, and that goat was, uh, his name was Jake, and uh, I would go trail riding with my pony, and Jake would, uh, we'd take Jake riding with us, because the goat didn't want to be left alone either. Uh, they're very, very social animals. So that was sort of how I got started, you know, my mom was a horse person, and uh, then I decided that I liked goats more than horses. So ever since that, I've, uh, I grew up on the East Coast and uh, participated in 4-H, uh, showed all across the nation, uh, moved out to California about 10 years ago, and then uh, started working here at UC Davis about three and a half years ago. 
Um, but that's my start with goats. Well, you said you were showing, you were showing goats or horses? Or? I was showing goats to clarify, <laughs> yes, yeah. I did a little bit with the horses, but the goats were really uh, what, what inspired me to travel a lot and meet different people and make connections all across the country. Um, showed goats. The very first interaction that I had with uh, UC Davis uh, in a goat capacity or really any capacity was in 2000. And seven, the American Dairy Goat Association National Show was in Gillette, Wyoming. And the barn manager at that time, Jan Carlson, she had traveled with goats uh, and students from here in Davis all the way to Wyoming. And that was, that was the first time that I saw the UC Davis Goat Barn goats. I was there uh, helping some folks and met Jan and met some students. And saw, basically, yeah, that was my introduction to UC Davis having goats. So goats, national network. <laughs> so Erica, I know you're a <clears throat> Davis graduate, and I've heard that you actually worked at the goat barn here. So could you tell us how you got there? What attracted you to working in the goat barn? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I probably started in goats about the same time that Ben did. Um, I was in high school and got a summer job working on a small farm over in Winters um, that had a little group of goats uh, that were getting sunburned. And so I made it my mission that summer to build them a shelter to protect them from getting sunburned and quickly learned that goats will destroy anything that you build for them um, without remorse. So that was my first introduction to goats. Uh, my family, my mom's family, have always been dairy cattle farmers in the Sonoma County area. And so when I started at UC Davis, when I applied as a high school student and wanted to go to UC Davis, um, my plan was to do dairy cattle as my specialty. Um, but my freshman year, I was looking for sources of income to help pay for school. And um, one of the professors uh, took me kind of under his wing and went and introduced me to um, kind of the different professors that had research going on. And one was with beef cattle, which I wasn't interested in. Um, and then there, there were a couple things I wasn't, but then there was one with dairy goats. And I thought, you know what? I kind of had fun with these guys before. So um, I ended up taking that job, helping uh, a research project with their dairy goats. And so I ended up uh, out at the goat barn quite a bit um, my freshman year. And that from that point on, I was hooked. They were, they were like puppy dogs that made milk. And I was like, I don't need cows. These guys have personality. So that was, that was when I, I hard switched from dairy cows to dairy goats. Uh, and I did my undergraduate here and then um, my master's here as well. And you tell us what you're doing now. <laughs> I am a dairy goat farmer. Uh, so I, after I did four years here at Davis, um, in dairy science uh, with my specialty in, in dairy and livestock management. Um, and then I moved to France and worked on a goat dairy for a year making cheese. Uh, came back here to do my master's uh, in animal biology and food science um, and worked on cheese making uh, as some of the research that I was doing in the animal science department, um, looking at impacts of some of the, the transgenic animals' milk on cheese production. Um, and so, I mean, from that point on, I, I was definitely going to be a cheesemaker and a dairy farmer. And I actually have a several offspring of the UC Davis goat, who was the national champion in the 2007 nationals that Ben would have met Davis goats at. Um, so when I, when I left, graduated um, after my master's program, I started a small herd of dairy goats um, and was working for another cheesemaker and just kind of plugged away at it. Had a friend um, who was a former viticulture and enology major or master student at UC Davis and the two of us started planning Penny Royal Farm, um, which we uh, started construction on up in Mendocino County. Uh, so we opened, I moved up there in 2009. We opened our creamery in 2012. Um, so we have a, a farmstead winery, vineyard winery, goat dairy, sheep dairy, and creamery uh, that's open to the public. So I am, I am an active goat dairy farmer and cheesemaker um, using my degree. Yay. <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> um, from our discussion, it seemed that the real benefit of the animal barns is to give students a chance to work with the animals. Um, 
So I'm going to ask Ben, um, when the students uh, work there, what are the sort of the technical skills they learn? What are the, I guess, the science skills that they learn when they're, when they're working in the barn? Oh, I'm going to give you that. <clears throat> The, as you may have gathered um, from what Erica was saying and my story of getting involved with goats, goats are a really great uh, gateway livestock in terms of an animals that have a lot of personality, a lot of, you know, sort of charming attributes, some challenging and frustrating attributes as well. But uh, overall, they're really quite endearing. They're relatively safe, you know, if you think about cows or horses and a lot a lot of the student body here at Davis, the undergraduate student body, comes from more urban areas or may not have a lot of livestock background. So like all of the animal facilities and especially the goat barn are a great opportunity for students to, the first thing is just to have hands-on experience working with uh, a livestock species and becoming comfortable working around the livestock, uh, understanding you know, basics of animal handling, uh, how to work with them, how to sort of react to engage you know, what's happening and what's going on in our you know, day to day care husbandry when we have veterinarians out from field services that are doing ultrasounds or blood collection, blood draws, you know, to have students there assisting us uh, is really a unique opportunity for them uh, and allows them to interact both with the animals and the professionals that support us. So that's, that's sort of the first thing is just the overall handling and the general experience that a lot of the students may not have prior to their time at Davis. On a technical level, they have the chance to milk goats, uh, which has been something that you know most most of them probably haven't, uh, and they can they, the goats get milked every day, twice a day, uh, six in the morning, five in the evening. Uh, so our student does done largely by student employees or residents that live at the barn. There's milking, feeding, cleaning, uh, hoof trimming tattooing, you know, if it's something that is part of our husbandry and day-to-day -day care, the students have an opportunity to really actively participate. And in most all of those uh, instances with the goats, um, they are tasks that students, you know, with training and teaching and oversight are able to do themselves. Uh, so it's a really, it's a great opportunity for them. Well, Christy, um I want to get at sort of the other experiences that students have. Like, do they, I mean, how does it prepare students, say, for work or, or a professional life? I mean, it, it, you might not think that the barn does that, but I think it might have an impact on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm just going to elaborate a little bit further um, that there are other facilities on campus um, in addition to the goat barn. So the resident program that we have here is a fantastic way to really get the students just right in there. Um, so some of the other barns that we have, just to quickly mention, would be the, the dairy. Uh, we have an avian facility. We have horse. Um, we have beef, sheep, pigs. So each one of those facilities, we have these residents that actually live at these locations. And so that's exactly what Erica did when she was there. So it's this great opportunity where you're literally responsible for the animals and their care sometimes on the weekends, holidays, whenever our staff is not there. And so it's this great opportunity to really jump in and feel that sense of responsibility that you have sometimes thousands of animals underneath you on this one weekend or holiday. And you're really getting that you know, experience to think through problems. Sometimes the animals ruin things or they, you know, things break. You have water lines. You, have, you get a great amount of this real life experience when you're out here. It's not the same as um, sitting sometimes in a lecture where you, you might be learning a lot about a specific animal, but once you get out there and start really working with the species, you have to be able to kind of understand what sort of behaviors you're viewing to predict if things are going to happen, prevent things from happening. Um, 
And so, yeah, it's this really great opportunity that you don't get sometimes that hands-on experience elsewhere from just sitting and maybe viewing even like an online course. So we really take a lot of pride in having this opportunity for students to come through and, and get that experience to, to then go out and into the real world or if they were to join someone else's barn and work for them, they know what it's like to actually be herding animals into a corral or whatnot instead of like, well, I saw this on a video, but I don't physically know what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so there's that sense of it. And then in terms of um, if, they, if someone wants to go on and do grad school or something, you can, you can also work with the faculty that are sometimes working at each of these facilities. So they will be doing research projects and um, usually having internships and other students that are at the barn or... Um, volunteers. They will come through and actually work with the faculty member or their grad students, help them conduct their research. Sometimes they're doing it the entire four years that they're here as an undergrad. And then they're getting that actual experience of what it's like to, to come up with a project, um, going through the, the highs and lows of projects. Sometimes they don't always work out, as you would think. Um, but yeah, so that prepares them to move on. And then if they want to go into uh, grad school themselves or you know, think about that sort of outline uh, area. But yeah. Um, Erica, <clears throat> in your, when you were working um, in the goat barn, um, like, were there things you learned there that you learned about yourself that taught you like maybe what you wanted to do when you, when you left? Um, well, I think one of the things I've discovered about myself uh, is that I'm quite anal about how I want things done, and that works really well for being a dairy farmer and a cheesemaker. Um, I think uh, no, I it was it was like Christy said, it's you're you're living it. It's not just a classroom experience. It is it is learning a lifestyle, um, and so yeah, as a as a resident in the barn every morning whether I had the morning milking shift or not, I was hearing the milking. And if I didn't hear the milking machines kicking on, I knew, hey, I better go check and make sure the milker is here. And so, um, I mean, that's translated into my life now as a dairy manager. I usually have my bedroom window cracked open. So if I don't hear that milking machine kick on at 5 a.m., I'm looking out to make sure the lights are on. So um, yeah, no, it, it, teaches you, it teaches you the lifestyle um, way beyond what you'd learn in a classroom. Um, and I think it exposes you to, to just every aspect of, of what those careers are, what that position is. Um, I remember we were doing um, an audit for an animal welfare certification for our farm, and the auditor sat down with me and, and went through all of our protocols. And I, you know, I have a hoof trimming protocol, I have our vaccination protocol, I have our kidding protocol, and all of those were developed because I was exposed to the protocols at UC Davis. And so Jan, who was the, the facility manager um, during my time, actively would teach us from these protocols and would talk to us about how she developed the protocols. And so I've translated a lot of that into, into our facility um, at Penny Royal. And so having this auditor come through who sees a bunch of different farms, he was just like, these are so comprehensive, it's so well written, no wonder you guys are, are doing things the way you do. Um, and I said, well, it's because I was a student at UC Davis. And his response was, I wish everybody was a student at UC Davis. So, so I think there, there is a whole lot that if I had just taken a class um, and then gone off and tried to start my own dairy, I would have been so deficient. Um, I would have understood maybe the basics of animal metabolism and, and how to develop a feeding program. Um, but by working at the facility, I learned how to also deal with inspectors. I learned how to, um, you know, I have to do a lot of documentation for water control. There's all these axillary things about raising animals that being at the facility, working with the manager, seeing what the facility manager is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, sort of the bureaucracy of being a farmer um, was something I learned. And I, and I learned that I would be okay with doing it um, because you sort of have this vision of yourself as a student that, oh, I want to be a veterinarian or I want to be a farmer and all I'm going to do is work with animals. And the reality is so much more expansive than that. And so I think, I think working as a student there, it showed me that I do, it gave me more of an awareness of what the job was going to be and an awareness that I was going to be capable of doing that myself. Do either of you have any other comments about uh, how this, you know, working in the barn helps 
prepare students for their careers. I mean, clearly, I mean, it, it created Erica's career. Uh, and do you see lots of students pick up on it? Or, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of thinking that there must be some students who realize, no, this is what I don't want to do. Um, I, I will say, uh, several of my closest friends are still people that were students <clears throat> in the goat barn at the same time as I was. I am the only one who's a goat dairy farmer. Um, but several of them are veterinarians who have a special interest in goats. Um, one of them also raises meat goats. So I, I think there's certainly a proportion of us that do go on to pursue goats as a career. Yeah. And I'll just add to that. Um, also, I didn't mention in the beginning, um, but I was the manager at the Avian facility for 15 years prior to getting this position. So I do have a lot of experience in having students come through my facility and where they go after. And so, yes, absolutely is there a path for everybody. And maybe it might not be in the poultry industry, but I definitely have some that have gone on to work at foster farms. Or it might be that they go on to vet school just because of the experience that they got there. Or might go into nutrition and work for a feed company that is still might be related to poultry or just animals in general. Um, but yes, there are so many things. And a lot of our facilities we have, we even have a meat lab on campus here. And we have students that go on into the meat industry and get positions directly out of college, which is really unheard of. But it's because they spent their time here learning how to work in a, a, a USDA approved facility where they're slaughtering, cutting meat, and selling it on campus. And so you just can't get that experience anywhere else. And, and again, that's a lot of what we take pride in, in having these animals on campus for the students to do exactly that. All right. Um, well, I, I, was, I wanted to <clears throat> ask Ben, what, what are the duties of students in the barn? Is there a, if you're living there, do you have specific things that you're responsible for? I think we've touched on that a little bit. So uh, definitely the first thing is the premise that Somebody has to be responsible at all times, which is a little bit uh, unique, I think, especially, uh, I'm not that old, but for, for kids these days, uh, you know, there might be an element that, you know, they're not, they don't always feel like they're responsible for something. So I think that, that is, that's like the number one thing that we emphasize when we do uh, review applications and interview candidates for the resident positions. You know, do they understand that um, somebody has to be around over Christmas or the holiday break or Thanksgiving, that it's, you know, everybody doesn't get to go home necessarily. And we really, most of the facilities, we have multiple residents, so we balance it out. So people, like, we still do respect their personal time and everything, but somebody needs to be there. And I'm around and I'm a resource and I think all the managers recognize that we're there to support the residents as well, but they that's part of the deal of them being able to have that room is that they are going to be there, whether it's for milking or a water line that might freeze or things like that. They're the person that has to triage and find the support, whether that's calling me or calling in something into facilities. So that's, that's the number one responsibility that we all try to communicate and really hope that we end up with students uh, that have the ability to take on that responsibility. And most of the time, our residents are students that have worked at the facilities in other roles as well. So I sort of think that there are sort of four tiers of student involvement um, at most of the barns. There are students that come through the facility as part of a class. And that may be one lab over the course of an entire quarter. Or that might be uh, all of the facilities have what's called a 49 class. So ANS 49, it's ANS 49D for the goats. And that for that class, uh, there's an hour a week discussion and then uh, three hours a week lab. So those are, they're out there every week for the entire quarter. Um, and then beyond that, most of the facilities offer internships as well. Uh, and then there are some paid student positions, and then there are the resident spots. So in most cases, students sort of build up slowly, and with each degree of involvement or tier of participation, there are different responsibilities that are taken on. 
Uh, for interns, the, the thing that, whether it's at the meat lab or uh, at any of the barns, a lot of animal husbandry or food processing is cleaning and maintenance. And it doesn't always seem real exciting, um, but it's also a good, good opportunity to just sort of build observation skills and, you know, you're working around the animals. What's normal for these goats? And, you know, they're daily schedule, you know, is this a time when they're active or, you know, most of them are active or maybe one's kind of back in the corner. I think I really try to emphasize to the students, you know, always be observant, even if the task you're doing seems relatively menial and maybe boring. Uh, make it a little more exciting by watching, keeping your eyes open and paying attention. Uh, so that's sort of at one end and at the other end, like I said with the residents, just the level of responsibility of all hours. Um, the primary sort of day-to-day -day tasks uh, for at the goat barn, milking is number one in terms of, you know, I think of importance and as a dairy facility what we think of doing. Uh, there's a lot that surrounds milking in terms of ensuring that the animals are healthy, that they're uh, minimizing any risks of health. Um, so we have protocols for what the milking is. And it starts with when we go to a pen and are ready to push goats up, we have, again, observation. Are all those goats behaving what's normal for those goats? Uh, goats are just like people. There are some that are a little slower and other ones that like to lead the way. Um, so you know if one of those ones that usually leads the way is a little bit slower, we definitely want to take note of that. So that's where it sort of starts, and they come into the parlor, uh, they get some grain in the parlor, a little granola mix, barley, a little bit of corn, molasses. Is everybody bright, alert, engaged, eating? Normally, do they come? We've got 12 spots in our parlor, and usually, like, there are one or two goats that always take those first couple spots, then there's kind of a middle mix, and then there are usually the ones that are just taking it easy and are usually at the end of the line. You know, is everybody in kind of their normal order? Do their udders, are they normal in terms of how full they are, the balance between the halves? Um, so there are, like, there's so much, really observation is the thing that I start with everybody with. And milking, after milking, feeding, cleaning, uh, then some of the, you know, things, tasks that may be weekly or monthly, hoof trimming, vaccinations. Uh, our breeding season is right now. If anybody smells a little bit of a buck, it may be <laughs> Erica or I that is the source of that. Um, but we have to do heat observations on the does so to know when, you know, they're ready to be receptive to the buck or for artificial insemination. Uh, and really, like, I, as much as possible, try to involve the students, especially the residents, in all of those things. So we just had our first ultrasound session with the vets from field services this morning, and we had our results of, you know, goats that were carrying triplets, or there was one that ultrasounded with four, uh, so that'll be a lot of work in about four months. Um, when she kids, uh, our, we have a little group text, and I sent that out to all the student employees and the two residents. And we're like, okay, mark your calendars. We're going to be busy uh, in five months or four months at this point. Okay. All right. Um, you, I know you mentioned this earlier, uh, Christy. Uh, I mean, uh, does the, and I, I think Ben actually mentioned this too, like I think getting involved with the goats, perhaps the barn, um, helps the students network for their careers? I mean, it, it, does it help them make connections outside of, uh, outside of Davis? Is that a source of connection? Do they meet people there while we're working there? Or how does that, does it really impact that? Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on, on what they're doing, but absolutely the, the faculty members that come through that are doing research, um, those are definitely sometimes working with outside companies in the industry. Um, so sometimes there's a, a networking possibility there. Uh, it really varies across all the, the different facilities. Um, now, now that you now that you mentioned research, could you could you describe maybe a, 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 an experiment or two? Not, not at the goat barn. I'll ask Ben about that. <laughs> Some other ones. <laughs> Yeah, so, so research is a, is a huge portion of what we, we do at the facilities. Um, so as I mentioned, we have all, all different species. Um, one huge one right now is we're very concerned with the uh, methane emissions. And so that is very popular in both our dairy and beef cattle facilities. 
Um, so they've been looking at um, nutrition studies where they're feeding different byproducts like garlic or um, seaweed. And there's all sorts of things that actually are helping reduce emissions. And so that's something that is, I mean, you, you'll, you even hear about it out in the news now. We have some really big uh, researchers that are well known like internationally. Um, so those are great opportunities for also students to get out and, and work with some of those industries. Um, other I guess you're not worried about the, the cows having bad breath or anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. There's others in terms of welfare. Welfare is a huge thing. Um, again, I know I, I speak a lot about the avian facility because that's where I came from. But um, in terms of going to uh, aviary-style cages, we've been looking at welfare issues with the keel bone. So there's a, the keel bone down the center of the breast of the bird that gets fractures that they found that um, birds that aren't raised in certain spatial awareness where they aren't, they aren't exposed to perches at a young age, they get introduced into this huge aviary when they're older and then don't realize that landing on a perch is very important to learn at a very young age. And so they're causing keel bone fractures. So we'll have uh, researchers looking at that, creating um, projects where you have multiple pens throughout an entire house where they have different replications and uh, studies to determine how is it that birds have spatial awareness. And it's very similar to research that is done in humans and how you actually see depth perception. So there's all sorts of fun things that the students also get to see in designing mazes and things for the animals and then training them how to go through them or um, yeah, walking across clear surfaces to see if the animal can determine if that is really, am I going to fall off the cliff or is it literally just a plastic um, surface that they can walk across? So, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. There's just so many opportunities at all the different facilities and, and every single species. There's some sort of research project going on all throughout the year, so. Okay, okay Ben, so you have to tell us at least one Cool project that's with goats, right? All right, um, I'm gonna share about two. Uh, and the most recent uh, was uh, from the Bliss Moreau lab. They uh, are in the psychology department and they do a lot of work with all different species in terms of emotion, affect, uh, cognition in animals and you know how it translates to um, interactions with people. They do some work out at the Primate Center. They, a few years ago with the goats, they did social network studies, um, which the first thing I thought when I heard that was like Facebook or like <laughs> what? Um, and now they were looking at how the goats within a herd form different social networks and bonds and you know, is it a clear hierarchical structure or you know, are there alliances? Um, in many ways, it sounded a little bit like high school was what it turned out, you know, well, this one is beta, except when this one is around, then it moves, elevates her status. Um, so that, that was pretty interesting. But most recently, they did a trial looking at how goats respond to different expressions of affect in people, so different emotional states in people. And they had stimuli printed on posters of uh, facial expressions, some that were sad or happy or angry. And um, they haven't had the chance, this was a follow-up to a project done in Great Britain, and they were working with a sort of different population of goats, so that was one way that this will augment that research. And there were a few other minor adjustments that they made. Um, and they haven't had the chance to process that data yet and really analyze things, but they're optimistic that they got some really usable uh, trials. What they did find, so they did a little bit of work with sheep previously, and the sheep have, generally speaking, a higher flight instinct than goats. Uh, the goats are very inquisitive, uh, especially the dairy goats. They get milked every day, twice a day. So they're very habituated in terms of interacting with people. So it was really a nice population to work with in terms of looking at how they respond to different emotional states in people. And they, for the first 14 days, they, the goats were engaged and they would put in their little stimuli and you know most of the goats would sort of in some way interact 
But then the goats eventually sort of lost, their attention span wandered. And that's a very, that's a very uh, in some ways we could have expected that because generally speaking, novelty is very important with goats. So they, they cut their trial short. They still hope that they have good data to work with, um, but the goats just were getting bored and distracted. <laughs> and so they had to sort of modify things and roll on the fly there. Um, so that was one really fun one that uh, just went on. And then the other one that I talk about is uh, there was a class, uh, ANS 134L, that's a lab section that runs basically a pilot research project. And last winter quarter, they worked with uh, goats. They split into two um, study groups, and uh, they were fed. These were all lactating does, and the students uh, formulated a ration. They assigned goats, you know, based on uh, sort of pairs uh, to each of the groups. And then we fed, and the, the basis, the difference in the two rations were the fat sources. So one was a palm oil-based fat supplement, and the other was a soybean oil-based fat supplement. And the focus was to look at how changing the fat sources um, altered the fatty acid profile of the milk. And like even beyond that, the potential impacts would be that you know, certain fatty acids are more beneficial for those who may be prone to heart health conditions or be pre-diabetic. Pre um, but for this class, they formulated those rations. We fed them to the goats in the milking parlor. They collected refusals. We collected milk samples, took milk weights. Uh, and then they took all that back to the lab and ran the analysis. And sure enough, they saw changes in the fatty acid profiles. Um, what was most interesting, uh, sort of an Im immediate perspective, was that so the palm oil uh, supplement results in a fatty acid profile that's more similar to cow's milk. And we did a uh, blind tasting at the end. And most of the students preferred, even though that wasn't necessarily as heart healthy, um, they preferred that milk that it had the palm oil supplement, which was, uh, could be somewhat expected because that would be most similar to cow's milk, which is what most of the students you know, were accustomed to drinking. I have heard uh, the professor, Dr. Vamani, he did tell me that uh, after that, though, that one of his students is completely sold on goat's milk and that's all she drinks now. So um, one a convert in that way, I suppose. But yeah, those are just a couple of the research projects. We work with the vet school a lot as well. Um, they run uh, pharmacokinetic trials, uh, some clinical trials. There aren't a lot of goats uh, at any research institutions, so uh, especially those with vet schools. So it's kind of a unique opportunity for them to work on some clinical stuff uh, that helps them in treating uh, goats that they may see in the field or in the VMTH hospital there. So Erica, did, did you do any research when you were, you must have done something when you were a student. I mean, did you take any of that with you? Um, I, yeah, uh, so I, when I was here for my master's uh, degree, my research was in Dr. Maga's lab. Um, they have a transgenic line of goats that um, they produce elevated levels of lysozyme. Um, and their objective was to have milk that was more shelf stable, um, particularly looking at in third world countries where refrigeration is not as available. Um, so having milk that, that could be, uh, animals that could produce milk that would have a longer shelf life in countries where you don't have uh, as much access to refrigeration. But we also don't want to make milk that you can't make cheese from, um, since making cheese is a way of creating shelf stability in milk and nutrition. Um, so my research project, having I had just completed my, my year living and working on a dairy in France making cheese. Um, and so I came back and as the, the local cheesemaker at that point, um, I, I took milk from those animals. So I would collect milk at milkings. I was a student at the barn at the time. Um, so I would milk the goats, separate individual milk from each animal. So I'd have her little half gallon bucket of milk that I would then make into batches of cheese. Um, and so we were studying um, the bacterial growth, uh, because when you're doing cheese making, you're typically adding bacteria to ferment milk, uh, to take it from milk to cheese. And so we wanted to make sure that the, while lysozyme might be impacting 
pathogenic bacteria that you don't want growing in milk, um, that we wouldn't negatively impact the beneficial bacteria that we're intentionally culturing the milk with to make cheese. And so I made cheese, and then we would I was studying the, the growth of the bacteria um, in the first stages of cheese production. So um, that, was, that was my research when I was here. Uh, and so we were successfully able to make cheese. Uh, the bacteria that we were adding were able to grow. We did see an impact on their, their life profile, but they were able to grow long enough to, to get us from milk to cheese. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I hear goat day is very popular. Maybe some of you will want to come out for Goat Day. They actually have, it's a, is it an open house? Like who comes there and what happens? So Goat Day is an annual event. Uh, January 28th uh, will be our 2023 Goat Day. And it attracts mostly people that are already in the goat community. But we certainly uh, welcome those that are interested as well. Uh, the it's a joint venture with animal science and the vet school um, talking about you know, the latest research. So a lot of those projects that I just mentioned will have uh, the PIs or graduate students reporting on those. Um, some general hands-on management, uh, usually in the afternoon. We, the morning tends to be more of a lecture style, and then the afternoon is more hands-on. And it's a really broad audience. Um, there are youth uh, that participate, that come. Um, they may only be 10 or 12. Sometimes they say their favorite part is the donuts at the beginning, but uh, hopefully they take a little bit more home than that in the afternoon as well. Um, and then there are also there are dairy goat breeders and meat goat producers that have been in the industry for 40 plus years that attend every year. It's really a great uh, get together in the winter, a lot of the slower time for many people, an opportunity for them to see all their friends and uh, goat family, so to speak. Uh, so that's it's a really popular event. Usually in person, we have about 250 to 300 people um, from all over California and even uh, all over the West Coast. We had somebody from the last in-person event who flew in from Hawaii as well. So it attracts quite an audience. Oh, that's great. Um, Christy, could you tell us about any support that you offer to high school students like 4-H? Is that does that do you have any students coming to the animal barns for that? Yes, we get contacted all the time by people wanting to do tours at our facilities. Um, so yeah, absolutely, there, there's that aspect of it where from all ages we will be contacted to do tours uh, at several areas. Um, another outreach that we do is something called Ag Science Field Day. So we do host the, um, it's an event for all FFA and 4-H students. Um, so they can come and practice the competitions that they would normally do in, if you're familiar with 4-H and FFA. Um, there's competitions at the state level, and then they can go on even to nationals. And so these competitions include um, looking at an animal and being able to judge them on confirmation or just looking at maybe byproducts coming off of them, um, looking at meat cuts in the meat lab. Uh, so a lot of our different facilities have this judging competition, and I think we bring around 5,000 students to this one event, and it's the first week in March every year. Um, so it is the, the state finals for the 4-H to go on and get into nationals if they do great at this competition. Um, so there's that level of it. And then, I don't know, any other things that you can think of in terms of students uh, from 4-H? Just interacting, I mean... A lot of a lot of students at the I mean we had the goat show team when I was at Davis, and so we would go compete in the summer with UC Davis goats at the state fair, and you'd interact with the local 4-H and FFA kids, and certainly a lot of my friendships now are are people that were students with me at Davis, but also people that I met, other kids who are now adults um, that were 4-H and FFA. So yeah, I think you're you're interacting with with students on a a wide level. And the, the, the groups that we encounter, uh, while a lot of times they're 4-H or FFA or industry 
oriented in some way. We also have some community groups as well, uh, like the Center for Land-Based Learning. Um, here they annually try to set up a tour where they visit at least a few of the animal science facilities. And those students are usually ones that are from schools or districts that have less exposure to animal agriculture. So that's an opportunity to sort of broaden our reach and allow those students uh, an opportunity to interact with the animals and hear about uh, what the options are and what possibilities there are for future involvement depending on their interests. All right. Um, I would like to switch gears here and see if we can get any questions from the audience. So got any anybody here have a question? We've answered all your questions. There we go. What do the goats do in their retirement? <laughs> the question is, what do goats do in their retirement? So um, most of the goats here at Davis uh, were in some ways uh, sort of fortunate that we have very um, productive outlets for those animals and that there are research projects that uh, most recently, uh, pharmacokinetic trials, so looking at drug residue depletion, so if an animal is treated with antibiotics, when do those antibiotics clear her system? So we'll uh, humanely euthanize the animal, harvest tissues, and we're able to use that data to establish parameters for safe treatment in the broader population. And we really, we try to capture as much value as possible. So like directly, we're supporting that research project uh, in the animal sort of retirement. Uh, and then additionally, we'll save uh, repro tracks that'll get utilized at the vet school for labs there. Uh, we'll take uh, liver and send that off for mineral panels and screening to ensure that everybody else in the herd is nutrition is really ideal. It's the most accurate way to gauge micronutrients especially uh, and whether they're being delivered adequately. Uh, we submit um, OBEX and brain sampling uh, for scrapie monitoring. So that's a TSE, a trans uh, spongiform encephalopathy uh, that there's a federal monitoring program for. So we submit tissue for that. So it's really kind of, it's a, it's a place where we're able to capture a lot of a value for the broader community um, when an animal reaches its end point uh, here at Davis. Okay, we got a, okay, um, yes, sir. I have a question. Does UC Davis have a plan to sell cheese from the UC Davis herd? Okay, the, the question is, does UC Davis have a plan to sell cheese? All right, so relatively recently, uh, construction was completed on the Noel, Noordfeld Creamery and Dairy. And unfortunately, it sort of coincided with COVID and everything that uh, resulted from that and supply chain and staffing issues and the whole litany that most of us are well, all too well aware of. Um, but yes, we do plan to sell cheese. Our basic production cycle is such that the goats are going into their off season uh, over winter. Like I said, we're you know confirming pregnancies now. Those kids will be born in the spring and then a lot of our milk initially will be utilized for the kids. So hopefully sometime uh, early summer, we'll have cheese available for sale. Um, and the most sort of clear uh, an immediate outlet will probably be uh, at the meat lab. So that's open on Thursday and Friday afternoons. Is that right, Christy? Um, so definitely through that outlet and potentially we've had an interest from uh, the co-op downtown uh, and some other outlets as well. The scale of our facility is such that it, you know, it won't be in grocery stores nationwide. <laughs> but certainly if you're interested, uh, hopefully we can find a way to get it to the customers that want it locally. Thank you. All right, we have a, could I see that question again? <laughs> it's um, asking to talk about the, uh, the herd at Penny Rural, where it goes from. Sure. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so it's kind of flashed up on the screen behind us a couple times, a picture of my barn. Uh, so at Penny Royal Farm, uh, we are milking 100 goats and 30 dairy sheep. Uh, my, my goat herd, um, I am the experimental queen in the dairy goat industry, uh, which means I love to crossbreed. So predominantly my herd is made up of La Manchas, uh, which have the very short ear. Um, and have really good milk production for cheese making. It's very high in protein. Nubians, which have the very long pendulous ears and their milk is higher in butter fat, um, which again, cheese is, is fat and protein. Um, and then Alpines uh, are a breed that have kind of erect ears and come in a bunch of colors. And they are, they're kind of the Holsteins of the dairy goat world. They tend to make a lot more milk, but slightly lower in fat and protein. And so I take those three breeds and um, I do a lot of crossbreeding. And so uh, the herd at Penny Royal, when people, we do tours of the barn, um, and so when people come through, you'll see lots and lots of very short ears and iterations, because when you cross a La Mancha with a Nubian, they come out with ears that can, we call them super elf ears. Uh, they, they can be a little bit longer than their traditional La Mancha ears. So that's, there's usually a lot of La Manchas represented, uh, and then the Nubians and, and Alpines as well. Uh, was there more to the question? Okay, yeah, so that's our herd at Penny Rail. I had a question for Erica as well. I wanted to know if you're, there were big differences between your the cheese production that you learned about in France and what you do at Penny Royal. Uh, yes and no. Uh, so actually one of the cheeses that I make, Bali's Molly's, is as faithful a reproduction as I can to the cheese that I was making on the farm that I lived in in France. Um, the difference being that I pasteurize that milk. Uh, so in the United States we have regulations in terms of cheeses aged less than 60 days need to be made from pasteurized milk versus in France everything could be raw milk. So that's the big difference but otherwise uh, the technique for making that cheese is exactly the same. We let the milk culture uh, for about 24 hours. Um, we're hand ladling with a ladle the curds into the molds, letting the whey drain for 24 hours, turning and salting, uh, drying, and then it develops kind of a blue-gray mold over the course of three weeks. Um, so I, I make that cheese as faithfully as I can to the recipe I learned in France. Um, and then I also make uh, a fresh cheese that we call lechi, which most people would be familiar with chev, just a, a fresh spreadable goat cheese. Um, and then uh, we do um, an, a harder aged cheese called Boont Corners that we age to several different uh, two month, our vintage is five months, and then our reserve is eight months and older. Um, and I, I do a blue vein cheese as well. So there's several types of cheeses that I make that I did not learn in France. I just was exposed to so many more styles of cheese living there. Um, it was just part of daily culture that we would have dinner and then we'd pull out the cheese plate. And so I, I was just exposed to more cheeses. Um, but yes, as much as I can, I, I fell in love with the cheese Fumayou that I made in France. And, and when I moved back, that was the one cheese that I knew I was going to make was something as close to that as possible. All right, a question from online uh, asking about enrichment for the goats. So uh, they've seen uh, wooden platforms or barrels uh, for goats to jump on and climb on and stand on. Goats are definitely uh, highly uh, active and, you know, if you think about, you've seen goats on the mountainsides or on uh, levees or dams or uh, climbing trees in some parts of the world. Um, so we do, yeah, we definitely do provide an enrichment. Uh, the, the, recently we were able to get uh, tree stumps and large, uh, very large in diameter tree trimmings that um, are probably about two feet tall. And the goats like to jump on those. They sort of uh, straddle their belly across them. Um, so yeah, we do, we do definitely provide enrichment. We also, we have some, uh, what, um, street sweeper brushes that uh, we utilize to allow the goats to sort of scratch up against. Um, we don't have the fancy, the cow dairy here has fancy automated ones that the cows just <laughs> lean into and they automatically rotate. Um, those ones are a little outside our budget right now, but. Uh, and a goat would break it. Yeah, and a goat, a goat would break it. Um, so, but yeah, definitely uh, provide enrichment. We've got. Uh, research project with a newer grad student that's actually looking at um, 
some specific enrichment activities for young kids. So kids when they're like less than two weeks old. Um, so that's very kind of uh, on the forefront. Um, but yeah, definitely we've got enrichment. And the other thing about enrichment is in some ways it's a little self-serving because if you don't provide a goat enrichment, it will create enrichment. <laughs> um, and usually that's at the expense of your facility in some way or another. All right. I see any more? Oh, we have one. Uh, one more question. So the question was, what do we do with all the babies every year? Um, and so, yeah, our herd would grow exponentially if we kept everything. Um, so what I do is every year in the fall, kind of leading into breeding season, I identify how many kind of replacements is what we call them. How many replacements do I need for two years from now? Because generally speaking, um, I will, goats can get bred and give birth at a year old. I tend to let them go and, until they get pregnant at a year and a half and, and give birth at two. So I'm trying to think two years ahead, how many old ladies do I have that are gonna be retirement age? And so that's how many replacements I need. And so I'll plan, well, these are the top 12 does in my herd for milk production, for structural quality genetics um, that I'll want to keep daughters out of for, for that. And so those does, um, I will plan the breeding of who's the buck that I have that I want to breed to her for, for the best possible daughter. Um, and then the majority of the herd, then I will breed to, I have boar goats, which are meat, a meat breed of buck. And so those will be a dual purpose baby. Um, and so then we just sell those kids. So in the springtime, I have um, a couple other dairies that will buy any females that I are in excess of one I wanted. Um, and then I've got a couple other farms in Mendocino County that will reliably come down um, in the springtime. They're, they're actually, I've been getting phone calls already asking, hey, when are they gonna be due? So I usually I'm selling to other other small hobby farms um, in Mendocino and kind of into the, the Bay Area too. I've had people come up from like San Jose. Um, we're all very aware of the fact that we've been living in drought and fire is an issue. And so um, that's kind of been a really good uh, Good thing for the dairy farmers because we have these goats that we don't need for milking all the boys. I mean, you're not going to milk the boys. So um, it's been really nice that there are, there's definitely been interest in people raising their own herds of goats for fire pre prevention. So um, I've had people buy them specifically because they want to start a fire prevention enterprise, but mostly it's people who have 12 acres or 20 acres and they just want to keep their own property safe. So they're buying goats for that. Yeah. Oh, uh, and then there's a question online asking if I can share more about my farm um, from somebody who would like to visit. And definitely everyone is welcome to come up. Uh, so Penny Royal Farm, we're located in Boonville in Mendocino County. Uh, so if you're taking 101 up uh, north of Santa Rosa, Highway 128 then runs out to the coast and we're about halfway between um, kind of the Ukiah area and, and Mendocino, the town of Mendocino. So we're in the Anderson Valley. Um, a lot of people who are familiar with it as a wine growing region, uh, there's a lot of wineries up there, uh, which is good for us because we get a lot of kind of tourist traffic. So our farm is actually open to the public seven days, or uh, sorry, five days a week um, from 10 to five. And we do tours uh, every morning that we're open. Um, and so the tour starts with um, our creamery uh, was built with windows all the way around. So you can see into each of the rooms of production and watch while me and my staff are in there making cheese. Uh, and then goes out to the milking parlor and we explain just how the animals use the milking parlor. Um, and from there into the barn um, where people get to go around the barn, see the animals. Uh, we talk to them about what our basic routine is, what the breeds are that they're seeing. Um, and so that usually takes about 45 minutes and then ends with a tasting of our cheeses. Uh, we are a vineyard and winery as well. And so um, we have a, a comprehensive, it's kind of winery, tasting room, cheese tasting room. Uh, we have a kitchen and a large uh, kind of vegetable garden, um, we call it our kitchen garden, and so we offer um, charcuterie boards, cheese plates, so we'll get a lot of people coming, doing the tour, and then staying for lunch. Um, so yes, everyone is welcome to come. Come up to Penny Royal and visit uh, if you wanna, wanna see what a goat dairy spawned by UC Davis can do. <laughs>
Christy, can you answer that one? Does it, no, I'm not the goat <laughs> person here. <laughs> Uh, the question from online is, I am planning to have a little farm when I retire. What is the ideal number of goats to have? <laughs> so uh, as I mentioned, you know, at one point I, there was just one goat. And then uh, prior to uh, managing the facility here at UC Davis, I managed a private dairy that had about 1,000 goats when I took this job. Um, and what I have gathered about goats is whether you have just a few or you have many, they will manage to fill your day. <laughs> so um, figure out what you want to do with your goats. And then, uh, you know, even if it's just two. The goats are highly social, so definitely recommend uh, really probably three or four in case something happens to one of them that way the other still has a friend and you don't have to go through the trials and tribulations of trying to find a goat quickly to be a companion for your goat. So definitely like three or four on the low end and beyond that, uh, whatever you know you may be able to imagine, I suppose. I've got 20 in my backyard. <laughs> you add one or two more, it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> All right, uh, we've got, to, okay, we're gonna to have to wrap this up. We've got one more question way in the back. What are some of the common diseases goats are more prevalent to get? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> um, one of the things we, I mean, we all, anyone who's got goats, the minimum you vaccinate for is clostridia and tetanus. They're really susceptible to that. Um, as long as you're vaccinating, it's usually not an issue. Um, but it's something that if you're if you're getting into goats, that's that's kind of the primary thing you need to vaccinate for because they are susceptible. Um, beyond that, I would say that pregnancy and giving birth, uh, when we're talking about dairy goats especially, is um, really taxing on. Um, just the general metabolism. And so we tend to see metabolic issues happening around the end of pregnancy or the start of lactation um, because these animals have been carrying their litter bearing. So they're usually carrying two, three, or four babies. Um, and as those babies are growing, they've got less and less room in their stomach for consuming food. And their ruminants, which means their stomach has to have a lot of room for fermentation. So they, they have a really kind of niche how much they need to eat versus how much room the baby's taking up. So it, it puts a lot of pressure on their bodies. And then all of a sudden they give birth and they're transitioning to milk production. So you tend to see um, issues related to metabolism. So just insufficient nutrition. So, um, you know, when my goats are giving birth, I'm watching the days leading up, especially if I see any sign of, she's not getting up and walking around as much as usual, um, supplementing nutritionally more than the communicable diseases. Um, as long as your herd is pretty closed, you're, you're not going to see so much in terms of communicable diseases. Do you have anything? Yeah, the only, in terms of communicable diseases, uh, really starting out with healthy goats is the key on that front. And then um, most of the other disease challenges, whether it's uh, metabolic um, or more specific, say, utter health, a lot of those just um, nuanced and informed management really are very good in terms of preventing those issues. Uh, one last, I think this will be the last question, hopefully. Uh, can people volunteer at the goat barn? <laughs> um, so. Uh, Unfortunately, as wonderful as the goats are, uh, within the university system, there are some challenges to that in terms of liability and that the answer is no, you can't volunteer, but we would strongly entertain the idea of you know an open house where people are able to come out and meet the goats and see the goats and uh, things along those lines. All right. <clears throat> well, let's let's wrap this up. Christy, could you let the audience know how they might be able to support the barns? Sure. So, as you can imagine, um, the animal science department and all its facilities require a great amount of um, care going into just facilities, feeding. So, there's a lot of money that goes into keeping these facilities alive. Um, and so, still, we like to always. Um, show you great people that come out of them <laughs> and, and what they can do for these students and where they go elsewhere. Um, 
throughout the industry. But yes, donations are always welcome. There's many, many ways to donate um, through the Animal Science website. We have things where you can go. Some people even put together scholarships for students, and you can special or specify where you want that to specifically go. Um, there's other funds that are already there that you can add to. Sometimes you can match other people's donations if they put things out there. We have a wonderful development team um, on campus as well, and so they are there to be contacted and help with a lot of those things. Um, and actually, one of the individuals is here today, <laughs> Oliver Ramsey up there in the top. Um, he is very great to work with, and we have a list of sometimes even just items that the barns maybe need, and it's something that someone can provide rather than just uh, money itself. But yes, there's so many ways to, to really help these facilities. And again, just emphasizing the importance of the students getting this hands-on experience and going through research projects or classes and, and the whole nine yards is is really something you can't find anywhere else. I know we kind of talked about other universities have kind of dwindled away from having those animals on site because of the cost to maintain and keep them going. And, it, and it's a lot, it's a, you know, yes, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365, that someone is literally at all these facilities every single day of the year. So um, any support would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Erica, do you have any closing comments? Um, I, I am just very grateful that I had my time at UC Davis. Um, it certainly changed the trajectory of what I wanted to do with my life, and I think um, every day I'm grateful for what I'm doing. Uh, so I'm very grateful for what I learned at Davis um, from in the classroom, but especially I think on a day-to-day -day basis, what I learned at the Goat Barn. Uh, is what influences what I do um, in terms of my career, just my life in general. Um, so I am I'm incredibly grateful for what I've been able to get out of the program um, in the six years that I spent here. Uh, that's why I keep coming back. I keep coming back to Goat Day. I, when they when Ben asked, "Hey, would you be willing to do this presentation?" I was like, "Of course, no problem." Um, it's it's been a a very um, yeah a very beneficial thing for me to have the facilities here. All right, so we've better wrap it up here. I want to thank Erica, Christy, Ben for contributing, for being here tonight. It turns out they're under review this week or next week, and they're scrambling to get their ALAC accreditation. accreditation. <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you. And thank you all for coming here tonight. Appreciate it. Um, we have a few other upcoming events that you might be interested in. There's going to be a program next week on Georgian wine. That's from the country, Georgia. Um, lots of history. Uh, they claim they have the oldest wine in the world. Um, other, another event uh, is one that I'm working on with Notre Dame, where I went to school as an undergraduate. They have a program called Think ND, and we have a program in December on viticulture. And then in January, we we'll have a program, uh, a mushroom program with a famous mushroom hunter. You might be interested in that program. And we do have lots of others that we're working on. We don't have it quite settled yet. So hopefully, well, you'll, you'll be hearing about our, our upcoming programs in the future. So thank you all for coming. And um, we'll see you at our next program. Good night.